Nicholas Kristof has been a longtime Pulitzer winning columnist for the New York Times. He recently announced his retirement, but over the last number of years, he's had a tradition around this time of year, and that is to have an interview uh, with various religious figures. And he, these are people who are at least professing in some way to be Christians. And he usually begins his interview like this, and I'm quoting from one of them, Merry Christmas. And let me start by asking about that first Christmas. Do you believe in the virgin birth? Doesn't that seem like one of those tall tales that people tell to exaggerate an event's importance and circumstances? The events are revealing. There are some who are evangelicals who will speak very forthrightly that they believe it's true and they honor the truth of it and they will talk in that way. Some who are, uh, well, we'd call them progressive evangelicals, switch the topic to talk about something somewhat related to that. And some, although this conversation took place at Easter, are a little more forthright. The woman involved is the president of a well-known, very liberal theological seminary in New York City and asked a question like that about the virgin birth. She said, it is a bizarre claim. I find the virgin birth a bizarre claim. It has nothing to do with Jesus' message. The virgin birth is there only, beco only becomes important if you have a th theology in which sexuality is considered sinful, which is a remarkable understanding of the virgin birth and things related to it and tells you a lot more about her agenda than it does. I am sure the early Christians would have been somewhat astonished by that particular answer. Nicholas Kristof isn't a believing Christian. He likes to talk about his faith. He puts it like this. I am someone who's drawn to Jesus teaching, but doesn't believe in the virgin birth or, any other, or his physical resurrection. But he's astute enough to know that there is something involved with the virgin birth that draws people's attention in one way or another because it's become a kind of marker. What you think about the virgin birth will say whether the Jesus that you claim to follow is a kind of mystical figure important for his teaching or his uh, example or his influence on history or whether he's a symbolic kind of figure, more myth than man, and you can kind of construct a do-it-yourself Jesus by taking this piece of him and this piece of him and this piece of him and discarding that piece or another piece. And what you think about the virgin birth will almost certainly play an incredible or be incredibly revealing about who he is. And yet Christians down through the centuries have made it part of their creed that Jesus was born of a virgin, not because it was symbolically significant, but because they believed that really is what it is. And it's part of what God has promised in the long history of how he was going to, as we looked at last week, crush the serpent's head and bring his Messiah, his king, into the throne, into the scene. Now, last week we looked at the idea of Christ before Christmas. That is, that Christmas doesn't begin even with the angel's announcement to Mary, but it is a long part of what God had promised going back to the very beginning. When God cursed the serpent, the great rebellious tempter against God and said, that from the offspring of the woman he had, test, he had tempted and drawn into sin was going to come his destruction, that it would be a human being, seed of Mary, uh, seed of Eve. And then we followed through when we noticed that then God in his providence narrowed the line and say of all of the families on earth that would be the descendants of Abraham, in whom all the earth would be blessed, and then out of the family of Abraham, it was Judah, 
who we are told would be the lion who would have the scepter until he comes to whom it rightly belongs, ultimately pointed to King Messiah. And then we went to Dan, uh, David, pardon me, to 2 Samuel chapter 7 and God's promise to David. And God's promise was that you won't build me a house, the temple, I will build you a house, a dynasty. The king who comes will be a Davidic king and he will always reign on the throne of David. There will always be a king of your ancestry or your, of your, in your descendants. Now this morning we're gonna to turn to Isaiah chapter seven as we continue this course of seeing Christmas before Christmas and the great prophecy that brings us to the truth of the virgin birth. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Isaiah chapter seven. And we'll think our way into this passage as Isaiah is given this insight into what God's plan is. Verse one, in the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, son of Uzziah, king of Judah, Rezin, the king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Remaliah, the king of Israel. Now, let me just pause there to say, Israel was once one nation, but you remember in 931, it split in two. After David, uh, pardon me, after Solomon died, and you had the northern kingdom of Israel. So Israel in this passage is the northern kingdom. And then there is Judah, the area reigned over by the Davidic king. Now it gets a little bit complicated because sometimes the northern kingdom, Israel, is called Israel. Other times it's called Samaria. And other times it's called Ephraim. So with all of that, we're talking about the northern kingdom. So he says, Pekah, the son of Remaliah, the king of Israel, came up to Jerusalem to wage war against it, but could not yet mount an attack against it. When the house of David, Davidic king, was told Syria is in league with Ephraim, Israel. The heart of Ahaz and the heart of his people shook as the trees of the forest shake before their wind. Let me just pause now and help you walk your way into this passage. It is 735, 734 BC. So we're almost 200 years since that great division of the kingdom. And the great power that is emerging is Assyria. Two different people, Assyria, that's out in what we would know as Iran and Iraq, and Syria, which is the next door neighbor with Damascus as its capital of Israel. Assyria is now the great emerging power with the ambitions of its emperor to sweep all the way through what we know as the Middle East, out to the Mediterranean and down into Egypt. This is as we would think of China today with its ambitions to be the world dominating power. That's Assyria making its way. And Syria and Israel are right in the line of march. And they though they have no chance of resisting. So they, even though they have been war enemies back and forth, they join together, hopefully, put a stop in the march of Assyria to the west. Judah, they also want to have involved. And they want to bring it in, so it would be the more you have, the more opposition. But Judah is under the leadership of King Ahaz. And Ahaz isn't willing to put his card in the, on the table with the other two. He's playing another game behind his, their back and he's wanting to align with Assyria. As a matter of fact, he is already gathering together funds to go and pay the Assyrians to be their protectors. Syria and Israel, the northern kingdoms, are aware of that, 
and they know that even though Judah's not very large comparatively, they would be an enemy behind their back. So they can't afford to have Judah aligned with Assyria behind their back with Assyria coming toward them, getting the kind of military picture at this particular point. And they've already begun to launch attacks. It says here they haven't conquered Jerusalem, but they've won victories around them. Now Ahaz is the king, and he's an awful man. He is, I would say, the second worst king in Israel's history, and the worst one will be his grandson, Manasseh. And it's a rather striking fact. He is a terrible king. He has offered one of his children as a sacrifice to Moloch, child sacrifice of one of his princes in the valley of Hinnom. He is given over entirely to idols. He will take Solomon's temple and he will strip it of gold and everything precious to try and buy off Assyria. He's had a a, a pagan uh, altar built and brought into the temple of God and have other things worshiped. He is a man that is utterly worthless. Interesting. His son will be Hezekiah. One of the worst kings has one of the best sons. And then that good son Hezekiah has one of the worst or the very worst king. Sometimes we think godliness runs in family trees. It sure didn't with the Davidic kings. So here's Ahaz, and he is aware of that he's in a very vulnerable situation. And so in verse 2, the emphasis here in this passage, it'll come twice. Once in verse 2, and then once in um, verse 13, I think it is, where it will not talk about Ahaz, it will talk about the house of Judah. Because that's the primary thing. Now, The northern coalition, Israel and Syria, have a goal to come and defeat Judah and put a puppet king in his place. If you look down at verse 9, you'll see his name, a man named Tabeel. And they're going to put Tabeel in place. So they will know that what happens in Judah will be what they want. Okay, with all of that, now we come to verse 3. And the next stage is initiated by God himself. And the Lord and Yahweh said to Isaiah, go out to meet Ahaz, you and Shear Jeshub, your son, at the end of the conduit of the upper pool on the highway to the washer's field. And say to him, be careful, be quiet, don't fear, And don't let your heart be faint because of these two smoldering stumps of firebrands at the fierce anger of Rezin and Syria and the sons of Remaliah. Because Syria with Ephraim and the son of Remaliah has devised evil against you, saying, Let's go up against Judah, terrify it, and let us compact it for ourselves and set up the son of Tabeel as king in the midst of it. Thus says Yahweh God. It will not stand. It shall not come to pass. For the head of Syria is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is Rezin, and within 65 years Ephraim will be shattered from being a people. And the head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is the son of Remaliah. If you're not firm in the faith, you won't be firm at all. So notice the messenger. Verse 3. The Lord said to Isaiah, go out to meet Ahaz, you and Shear Jeshub, at the end of the conduit of the upper pool on the highway to the washer's field. Now, Jerusalem didn't have any underground water supplies. So he's going up to this pool almost certainly to do a kind of investigation. Do we have enough water? Uh, Will we be able to survive if they put up a siege? What are our water supplies? How can we manage them? How can we protect them? And he's up there doing this investigation full of fear, as the previous verses said, and shaking. And Isaiah goes. And in an interesting way, it only happens here, the Lord says, make sure you take your son, Shear Jeshub, 
with you. Now, we don't see it when we read that, but his son has a very interesting name. It is both bad news and good news. It means a remnant will return. Now think about the implication of that. It's a prophetic name. You're going to be reduced to a remnant. Judah is not going to stay for long. It's going to be reduced to a remnant. And that would happen when the Babylonians came in a century or more later. But will return. You're, you're going to be severely defeated, driven out, but you'll return. Now, I'm not sure whether they paid any attention to that, but that's what the message is, even his name as he comes. He's preaching through the name of his son. But he comes to Ahaz, and he first calls him to faith. It is a little bit like that slogan which was recovered a few years ago uh, that came from World War II, and it had been missing and all of a sudden it came everywhere. You remember the one? Be calm and carry on. And it was designed, and these were road signs that were actually given because they expected the Nazis to cross the channel and come into the line. Be calm and carry on. The good old British, your stiff upper lip and press on. Well, there's a little bit of that in verse, uh, in verse five, four when he says, be careful. Be quiet, calm yourself, don't fear, don't let your heart be faint because of these burning brands. The fire's gone out, there's only smoke that's coming from them at this point. You need to trust me. Now that was precisely Ahaz's problem. He had no intention of trusting God. His Bets were on Tiglath Pileser. That's the Assyrian emperor. And his heart was somewhere else. The only thing he could think of is, oh, Syria, come to my help. And Isaiah is coming to say, no, you're looking in all the wrong places. Trust me. And then God says, I want you to know they are frightening you. They've devised plans against you. Verse 6, let's go up against Judah and terrify it. Let's conquer it for ourselves and set up the son of Tabeel as king in the midst of it. Now, if you read what happened because of his refusal to obey, we are told that 120,000 soldiers of Judah were killed in the battle that ensued between Assyria and them, and 200,000 people were deported. But he's saying, don't trust them, trust me. Because if you wait, Syria and Israel will be gone. And as a matter of fact, within 65 years, Ephraim will be shattered. It is 735, 34. 732, Damascus will be captured and Syria will be removed. 721, Israel will be occupied in the capital Syria and it will be deported by the Assyrians to another part. And then in 649, Esser Hayden, the more recent one, will deport all the rest. The northern kingdom ceased to exist as God had promised. So that comes the final word that he is not willing to hear, but it is there. If you're firm in faith, if you're not firm in faith, you won't be firm at all. You need to trust me. I can handle this. You can't. Then in verse 10, God speaks again. We're not sure that it's at the same time, but it seems to be. Because God is going to boost up Ahaz's faith. Again, Yahweh spoke to Ahaz. Ask a sign of Yahweh your God. Let it be as deep as Sheol or as high as heaven. Let your imagination be free. It can be anything whatsoever. But Ahaz says, I will not ask. I will not put the Lord to the test. 
And he's pretending to be too pious to do that. After all, Deuteronomy 6.13 says, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And we're specifically told, don't test the Lord God. Don't give tests of various kinds. But God had offered, if it is wrong, to give a test and demand that God do this. If you do this, then I'll do that. And we find many Christians falling into that. It is wrong also if God says, ask me for a test. And you say, oh no, I don't need it. He didn't want it. He'd already set his heart. And so in the light of that, God says in verse 13, and he said, hear then, O house of David, so he's not just speaking to David, or to Ahaz, he's written him off. He's not interested in going that way. He's now speaking to the larger truth of the line of David, the royal line, the basis of the nation. Here then, O house of David, is it too little for you to weary men that you weary my God also? You're wearing me out, obviously, symbolic language with your refusal to trust and believe and playing all these word games. And here it is. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin will conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. He will eat curds and honey. Now, that is language in this kind of context to describe people who are scraping their living from nature. Not that they'll eat planted corn or planted grain and all of those things, but curds, butter because they'll be cattle still, and honey, you're going into various places to grab honey because this is the food of the poor, of the overrun. He shall eat curds and honey when he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good, reach a, an age of understanding. For before the board knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land whose two kings you dread will be deserted. Twelve years. Both of those nations had been destroyed. The Lord will bring upon you and upon your people and upon your father's house since days that have not come since the day of Ephraim departed from Egypt, I'm reading verse 17, the king of Assyria. You're trusting the king of Assyria. He's going to ravage you. And it was Hezekiah that had to deal with all of those kind of features of what was going to happen. Now let's go back to verse 14. Verse 14 is mysterious in all kinds of ways and it raises all kinds of questions. It is a sign given not so much to Ahaz, but to the Davidic family, the Davidic king. Now there's questions related to it and it's been debated and I don't want to go into all of those. This isn't a class in which we're discussing those things, but it has two main parts. There will be an unprecedented pregnancy and there will be an unprecedented child. And both of those things are what is said, behold, the virgin, not merely a virgin, the virgin shall conceive and bear a child. Now, around this, this totally unique pregnancy, we come to that word virgin. It's an interesting word. It's not used very many times in the Old Testament. It's the word Alma. And it looks at a young girl of marriageable age. There's another word like it. And sometimes you hear people saying, well, there was a word that meant virgin in the Hebrew language, and Alma isn't it, it's Betula. Betula is used a lot more, but it's almost identical. It means a young girl of marriageable age. The difference between the two is there are several occasions in which Betula looks at a girl who has had sexual activity, almost never used in that way. It is always used of a young girl. They didn't have a particular word, virgin, that looked at sexual activity. But 
in the Old Testament culture for a young girl, and that would mean 13, 14, about eligible for marriage in the culture of that particular time, the clear presumption is that they would be without sexual experience. So when the translators of the Old Testament into Greek from Hebrew translated this verse, they translated using the word virgin. Now there's some who say, well, this is just a young woman, but there's no sign that says anything by a young girl getting pregnant. That's part of nature, that happens all the time. But this will be a sign, it will be miraculous. It will be out of the normal. And so when the New Testament picks this up, it again is a reminder of the virgin nature of this pregnancy. Only that would be a sign that would speak about God's care and provision and God's plan. It is the virgin. But you'll notice then, it says, and she will bring forth a son whose name is Emmanuel. With us, Imu, El, God. And the special message of the prophecy is not the special pregnancy, but the special child. That it is the child will be God with us. Now, in one sense, that's a common idea. God is with us. God is with his people. But this name in this context doesn't simply mean God is with us. It means he is God with us. We'll come next week to chapter 9, which will talk further about this child, and it will say he shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Almighty God. And none of that would have been immediately apparent at that time as Ahaz, even as Isaiah said that. It will only be in the course of time that that will become clear. But in chapter 8, the name Emmanuel is used again and it talks about your land, O Emmanuel, meaning Israel. This is the name of one who will come as king and as Isaiah 9 will say the government will be upon his shoulder. So we come to the New Testament and let's remind ourselves in Luke chapter 2 of the first announcement that the time for God's child has come. In chapter 1, verse 30, the angel said to her, Don't be afraid, Mary, for you found favor with God, and behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will call his name Yeshua, Jesus. He will be great and be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. There we are to the house of David, as we headed chapter 7. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I'm an Alma? I'm a virgin. And the angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called holy, the Son of God. It was six months, five months, seven months later that the same angel appeared to Joseph who discovered that his bride-to-be was with child. And the angel of the Lord appeared, verse 20, in a dream saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in him is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus 
for he will save his people from their sins. And then Matthew, under the direction of the Holy Spirit, writes, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken to the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. How can you believe that? I mean, it, it, they're obviously borrowing from pagan myths. I mean, haven't you read those stories that the Greeks tell about virgin births? They've just borrowed this to try and exaggerate that. Are you kidding me? Have you looked at those stories? Those stories are nothing like this story. They're only the flimsiest resemblance. And listen, these are Hebrews. These are Jews. They didn't follow pagan myths. They rejected them. And the ones who became Christians, those Gentiles, they stopped going to the temple. That's why they were opposed so greatly. They didn't worship like pagans did anymore. Don't tell me they did what was totally opposed and borrowed a Hebrew myth. Yeah, I know. Maybe that's okay. But they didn't know much about biology then. They, they didn't understand. They didn't have our scientific world view. And they didn't understand how impregnation works and all of these kind of things. Uh, did you hear Mary? What did she say? How can this be since I don't know a man? She seemed to be fairly aware of how it worked and she was what, 13 or 14? Chronological snobbery looks back and said, we're the enlightened ones, and they didn't know anything. And that is nothing other than chronological snobbery. These didn't know all that we know, but they knew the obvious realities of life. Uh, what do we do with all of this? Well, one of my responses is, listen, the virgin birth really is not that big a thing for me. Because I know a God who spoke everything into existence, who spoke and created all things, who rules and reigns over all. And while a virgin birth is unknown to us, it's no big problem for God. If you had a God big enough to create everything, why are you concerned about this? And, and secondly, if God is big enough, I need something more than an ordinary birth to explain who Jesus was. I mean, the one we're talking about here is God the Son. He rose again from the dead. He did all of these miracles. If he is God the Son, then it wouldn't be surprising to me if he was born in a way that no one else was born. It stands to reason. I don't believe in, in Jesus as the Son of God because of the virgin birth. I believe in the virgin birth because Jesus was the Son of God. It's the resurrection that you need to think about. If Jesus rose from the dead, then that opens the box of understanding of what could happen. But listen, I might say, you have trouble with the idea of a virgin birth, and yet you believe in a virgin universe. You, you believe that something came out of nothing. You believe that where there was nothing, all of a sudden there was something. You believe that organic life came out of non-organic life. You believe that out of unthinking life came intelligent life. You believe in a virgin universe. 
I believe in a virgin birth. And I like my virgin better than yours. <laughs> it makes better sense of life. The virgin birth tells us that Jesus was truly human. He wasn't implanted in Mary's womb. Mary's body was part of it. If you went to Ancestry.com and you could have Jesus' DNA, it would trace its way back and you would find the marks of David's family all the way through it. He was fully and truly human. And yet it would be a strange DNA. Because even though he was fully and truly human, he was fully and truly God. He did not begin in the womb of Mary. He eternally was. He took to himself a human nature. He didn't change who he was. He never ceased to be all that he was. He is God with us. And did you notice in both passages that talk about the reality in the New Testament, that talk about the reality of the virgin birth, first to Mary and then to Joseph, both times it's emphasized, you shall call him Jesus, Yeshua, Savior. As a matter of fact, the angel Gabriel underlines it to Joseph. Call his name Yeshua, Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. The special child came to fulfill the promise to David, but even more to fulfill the promise to Eve that the evil one would be defeated. And by the serpent striking his heel, the very thing that <coughs> appeared to end Jesus defeated Satan. He came to save us from our sins. I said it last week, Christmas and the event we celebrate isn't the beginning of the story. It's a part of the story, begun in God's purposes from the beginning of human history and centered on this great event of God becoming man. In, in some way, it is a climax of the story, but it's not the culmination of the story because the story doesn't end at Christmas it doesn't end at the cross. It doesn't end at the resurrection. It won't end until Jesus returns in power and glory. And every eye will see and every tongue will confess, Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. God with us is God for us so that we could know our sins are forgiven and we have a relationship with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. As always, I want to just press home, have you trusted Christ? And if you have trusted Christ, are you allowing your heart not just to go into this Christmas in a normal way, but to fill your heart with the wonder of what this season is all about. That though he was rich, for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might be rich through receiving forgiveness and eternal life in Christ. We're going to celebrate the reality of not just the incarnation of Christ, the becoming human of Christ, but the crucifixion of our Lord, the center of why he came, as we come around the table and we remind ourselves that he really had a body. That's what this passage is all about. And he also shed his blood 
And that's what the statement to Joseph, he will save his people from their sins, is all about. And he did it for our sake and in our place. So, Father, as we come to take these symbols, we thank you for what they represent. The most astonishing truth in all of history that we're the visited planet by you who came to live among us so that we might live with you forever. As we take these symbols, fill our hearts with your grace and goodness and humble our hearts in repentance and trust. In Christ's name, amen.